Who is the most badass person you've ever met? Story 1. Had this thing at school where I met an old man. This was back in early 2000s. I was talking to a group of people like most 16-year-olds do. I talked about how school sucked and it's hard to compete with everyone. Old man tells me to count my lucky stars for my opportunity. I kind of blow it off. 30 minutes later, I'm in the auditorium to hear a guest speaker. The old man gets on stage and tells his story. His name was Alter Weiner, and he was a Polish Holocaust survivor. When he was my age, he was held in Buchenwald. He told several stories about how he had planned to charge the gates so they would terminate him. A couple about being in line to be executed and feeling relieved. After he told his story, I realized uncomfortably exactly what he meant when he said I should count my lucky stars for the opportunity. He was badass because he was ready to pass away from the pressure he was under, but chose to keep going. He pushed through and on the other side of that tragedy. He had a family, a home, and a life of constant gratitude. I came back from a deployment and got out of the military. I lost a big part of my identity and was in a deep depression. When it got down to the darkest points, I thought about Alter and how happy he was. Story 2. My mom, she grew up in China with her parents and sister living in basically one room. She had to attend night school, where everyone told her she would never make it to college. She did and went on to win awards as an architect. She then married my father and moved to the States, where she worked years as a waitress while my dad went to school. Then my dad was terminated by a drunk driver. She had six months to be remarried or we had to leave America. She decided she wanted to stay here for me because by then my Chinese lacked very badly. I moved here when I was five. Somehow she found an amazing man who knew our situation and helped us in every bit he could. Then my stepdad got diagnosed with a disease called PSP where basically he slowly loses every single function he has. These days, my mom spends her time turning him in bed every two hours to avoid pressure sores, feeding him though his feeding tube, cleaning his incontinence, giving him daily bed baths, all with as much love as the first time they met. She also works a full-time job as an AutoCAD designer while maintaining an amazing backyard garden, while also keeping up with her own gallery and art. She gets around four-fifths hours of sleep every single night, Yet somehow, every time I see her, she has a huge smile on her face and is very energetic and cheerful. I don't know how she does it, but she gives me hope to be an amazing person as she is. Story 3. I met the guy who was the first person to ever travel across the entire continental U.S. on horseback. He didn't even set out to be the first person to do it. He just went out and did it because he wanted to and was shocked to find out later that no one had ever done it before when he also found out that no one had ever traveled from the Canada to Mexico borders on horseback, he set out and did that too. Story 4. My mom, when she was in her early 20s, she got bucked out of a moving vehicle and had severe brain damage. She was supposed to be dead within 48 hours, and when she lived, they said she'd be a vegetable for the rest of her life. Instead, she woke up, relearned how to walk, talk, read, and function, and walked out of the hospital on her own. I was a mistake that she raised on her own without complaints. She raised me alone, went to school, got into nursing, and weaseled her way out of the projects into an honest-to-God house, without child support for the bulk of my childhood. I can honestly say that I had an amazing childhood, and she never once made me feel like a burden. I have never seen her back down from anything, ever. Somebody trying to break in? Well, they ain't gonna get far. Ex-boyfriend threaten her daughter? Bad person, she dares you to open that gate. Boss lowballs her and then has the gall to call her lazy? Have fun because she can be put to better use elsewhere. She's now fighting ovarian cancer with a very low chance of surviving. And her response to talking to hospice is, I will never talk to them. I'm not done. She was offended they gave up on her. She's in a bad place now, but she's lasted way longer than they anticipated and has even been improving. She just kind of shrugs it off. In her mind, she doesn't have to relearn what English is. So, you know, this should be easy. I wish I was half the woman she is. Story 5. My uncle. He was terminated in Vietnam in 1966. He enlisted because he hoped it would keep somebody else from being drafted. I grew up looking at the box of medals they sent home with his body. He saved his squad by jumping on top of a grenade that was thrown at them. Story 6. A guy who fought in the 1956 Hungarian uprising. He fled Hungary as a teenager and ended up a mercenary in Africa and Asia for 20 years. He migrated to New Zealand and worked a lot of the same jobs as my dad. Had more scars and bullet holes in him than I thought possible. Story 7. My grandma. She broke her neck in a car accident driving in a rural road in winter. The car went into the ditch, and unfortunately, no one was around for ages, and night was coming soon. So she managed to climb out and for quite a distance to the nearest house. This was decades ago, and now she's almost 90, and despite chronic pain, she's traveled the world and lives on her own still. Story 8. Harold. I met him when he was in his 90s. He married my widowed aunt. In WW2, he was a B-17 pilot, 
and his plane was up terribly in a bombing run over France. He and his co-pilot kept the plane in the air and allowed his crew to bail out. Then he and the co-pilot went to bail out. Harold said when the co-pilot got in the door to jump, he froze. In Harold's words, I kicked him in the peach so hard he fell out and then pulled his. Harold laughed and said, I got a medal for saving him. But the thing is, that plane was completely on fire, and I wanted out of there, and he was in my way. Because Harold was the last man out of the plane, just as he deployed his parachute, the plane exploded. Harold was knocked unconscious, and though he sue vices the landing, he was injured with broken bones. All the rest of his crew got to safety with alien troops, but Harold was captured by the Germans and held as a POW until the war ended. I think he qualifies, but my father, several of his brothers, and several of my mom's brothers all served in combat in WWU. They were all over the world, and they all came home. They were pretty badass as well. Plus, they terminated Nazis. Edit. I have posted about Harold before. Edit. I just want to thank the people that have posted here in reply to the apologists for the German military. They were not innocent. The war terminated in excess of 80 to 90 million people worldwide, and the Nazis and the Japanese started it by invading their respective parts off the world. The people who were in charge got to be in charge through the acceptance and support of the people in those countries. The crimes and slaughter of millions of innocent people happened with their support, or at least with them pretending nothing was happening. The non-Nazis who did help people did so at great personal risk of being exposed by their fellow countrymen who were marching right along. Fudge Nazis. They were scum then, and they are scum now. Story 9. My dad, he served in Vietnam as a Marine, was discharged with a Purple Heart, then joined the Navy and became a flight surgeon. He could fly F-18S and perform surgery, not at the same time. After his military career, he became an emergency room surgeon, always saving lives. He passed in 2013 due to dementia and left us way too young. He's my absolute hero and hands down the most badass person I've ever met. Story 10. My late father-in-law. Age 13, the Russians came into his village of ethnic Germans in what is now Serbia. His father, one of the largest landowners in the area, in the front parlor. They assaulted his mother and older sisters in front of him, dragged the whole family off and put them in death camps where they were worked to death but by bit. His older brother was sent to the mines in Siberia. He escaped from the camp three times with his two older brothers and got their mother and sisters out of the women's camp. Recaptured and beaten almost to death, they kept them alive because they could repair electric circuits. Finally escaped and smuggled the whole family of seven out of there, walked across the Alps into Austria, wove baskets from reeds and traded them for food, finally ended up in a U.S.-run displaced persons camp, worked for five years doing construction, delivering milk, and any job they could find until they were able to immigrate to the U.S., worked as a welder and ran a cleaning business, bought a house, raised two children and sent them to college, never became a citizen because he never learned to read or write English, and hid it from everyone but his wife. Dying of emphysema, he got a notice that ICE was thinking of deporting him because he had let his green card lapse. I drove him up to the federal building and wheeled him in his wheelchair. The officious clerk said, so we may have to deport you. I laughed and said, to where? Read his green card, citizen of no country. Oh, he laughed and told jokes. The ICE lady started laughing, and she got his green card renewed in record time. Surviving that kind of childhood and then living a good life? Total badass. Ed, better location, thanks, Reddit. Story 11. Dad has been gone for almost 30 years now. I remember working in the garage with him one day. He was working on a V8 engine block on the bench and needed to move it to the other end of the bench. He grabbed it with two arms and started to the other end of the bench. The block slipped out of his grasp and landed on his foot. He did not flinch. He picked it up and placed it on the bench and kept working. At the time, I was 6'4 and 235 pounds. I knew then I was never going to mess with him. Story 12. My uncle is the only survivor of the squad he commanded in Afghanistan. Not a single one of them passed away in combat, but everyone except for him terminated themselves after returning home. He wasn't functional in public spaces for years after the fact due to PTSD, and his wife couldn't take the stress and divorced him. The fact that he's still alive in a miracle. The fact that he's happily married, perfectly functional in public, and makes unreasonably good money etching barrels is just a testament to the dude's willpower. Story 13 I feel like I met a lot of badasses when I worked at Apple. Shocking, I know, but we weren't all nerds. But Don was by far the most badass. When I left, he was 82 years old and sharp as a tack. He kept up with the breakneck pace of the genius bar appointments with the best of us. He lived on a mountain and every morning he'd run to the summit. He climbed Mount Baldy at 79 without breaking a sweat. He was a classically trained opera singer, an orchestra conductor, and a music professor at a local college. He spoke fluent German and Spanish. I think he went to seminary school at some point too. 
He was definitely a pastor at his church. He was all around an incredible guy with an awesome life story. I might never work with anyone like him again. Story 14. My grandma. She only had one hand, lost most of her arm in a car accident when she was in her teens. This woman could tie a squirming toddler's shoelaces, trap, skin, process rabbits into a delicious stew to feed the family, and generally run a household of 10 people with one hand. Story 15. Not a person, but this ginger cat that wandered down our drive one day, one eye missing. What seemed like half of his brain exposed, gashes everywhere, just skin and bones. We fixed him up and named him Butters. He guarded our house with his life and would take on any dog, coyote, anything that tried to come up. He once fell asleep on a visitor's car and clung for dear life a couple miles down the road until our friend realized he had this chunky peach cat sprawled out like a starfish on his back window. Story 16. I knew a guy once. He was leaving his house to go to work, and a crackhead rode up on a bike and tried to mug him. He punched the guy in the face, took his bike, and then ride it to work where he welded all day. I grew a full beard just from hearing that story. Story 17. My dad. He can do anything he sets his mind to. He's 5'8 and 140 pounds but can lift anything. Built our family house. Fixed cars. Coached my hockey teams growing up. Worked in candy trafficking. Then child prohibited photos digital forensics. All that and he's still proud of the lump of a son I am. If I can amount to half the man my father is, I'll have done all right. Story 18. My grandpa. He worked in coal mines at nine. Married my grandma knowing her brothers wanted to terminate him for it. Took care of a family of 11. He was 4 foot 11 from growth retardation from working in coal mines. And in his six O's, he could lift a twy or 300 pound rock himself and carry it across a lawn. He had lung disease and still lived into his 90s. He was a tough little guy. Story 19. I once watched Junior So defuse a situation where a drunk dude just wouldn't stop badgering this girl and his crew. Dude wasn't handsy or anything, just kept following them around, constantly inserting himself into their fun, and all the while just constantly hitting on this lady. Junior finally stood up from the blackjack table, cracked his neck, picked the dude up by the belt and the scruff of his neck, carried him ten feet away and said something to him quietly before setting him down. Junior went back to playing blackjack and dude bugged right the fudge off. Annoying dude was actually pretty big. Junior picked him up like a toddler. Story 20. My employee, Lindsay. I met her almost 12 years ago when she was a high school culinary student working in my favorite cafe. Two years later, I owned the place. She has weaved in and out of my life. She was working at the cafe during her first pregnancy. The moment she found out she was pregnant, she stopped all caffeine and immediately started eating healthy. She worked full-time and almost never complained or call out. She developed kidney stones around month six. Around month 10, she asked for a break. I thought she was going in labor. No, she was crying because she thought she was letting me down if she didn't work through the pain. She didn't want to use pregnancy as an excuse. I hugged her and explained what a true flipping badass I thought she was. She stopped crying and just accepted that it was time to stay home until that baby decides to arrive. She lost two lives of her life, numerous friends and family to suicide, and hardship upon hardship. During all this time, she has inspired me with her silent strength. She is never the loudest one in the room, but always the most present. She has become this amazing wife and mother. I am lucky that we got her back on the weekends. When I first took over, I took everything too personal. I expected everyone to be logical and rational customers. Eventually, wise Lindsay looks me deep in the eyes, full of 17-year-old wisdom, and said, Complainers be complainers. This moment gave me a massive boost of confidence, and I quote this to all my employees. My employee is a flipping badass. Story 21. I've been thinking about this question all day, so I had to post it. Anyways, I'd say the most bad peach person I ever met was this absolute mad lad German guy in Namibia. My friends and I booked a desert tour of the Namib with him. He picked us up in a WW guy German ambulance and rolled us on over to the desert. He decided he wanted to show us a snake. This guy slows down the ambulance, leaves it running and doesn't even put it in park, and just jumps the fudge out and sticks his whole hand into a bush but doesn't find a snake. He did this a few more times before he just pulled out a flipping pit viper and shows it to us. Then proceeds to tell us, never stick your hand in a bush. He then started driving up and down the sand dunes, not giving a fudge. I swear we were at one point going down at a 90 degree angle. The guy was slightly nuts, but I had a lot of fun and learned a lot from him. Story 22. My dad, till the day he passed away from cancer, served in both the Israeli and Russian army, obviously different time periods, moved to the United States with my mom to start a new life with my family for the rest of his life, for 35 years in the U.S. And everything about him was badass. I had these bullies in high school who picked on me, private all-boys school, and they just wouldn't stop. And the teachers and no one else did nothing about it either. And one day, instead of my mom picking me up from school, my dad picked me up, 
He saw that I was upset and I broke down crying because I couldn't take the torment I was taking from these bullies anymore. So my dad asked where they were and I pointed outside the car and he yelled for their names and I don't know what he said to them. He didn't hit them, obviously, but it was enough to have them stop picking on me for the rest of high school. My dad was my hero that day and forever and that exudes such a level of badass and respect from me that day. My dad was tough and strong till the day he passed away. I'll never forget how strong he was even on his deathbed, but he left such an impact on my life that no other person ever could. That's why he was so badass to me. Story 23. My grandmother. She wrecked a riding lawnmower down a 20-foot ditch at 80 and pulled herself out with one arm. She still has a bad arm from it, approximately. Ten years later, she accidentally set her one-acre yard on fire, and she beat the fire out with a wet dish towel before the fire department got there. With one good arm, ETA. She was 80 years old, not doing 80. My B. Story 24. My Uncle Woody, big Native American, fought with the 164th North Dakota National Guard Infantry on Guadalcanal in WW2, sent to reinforce the 1st Marine Division. At first, the seasoned Marines had their doubts about them, but after the Japanese were defeated at Guadalcanal, they referred to them as the 164th Marines. He was wounded and decorated for his actions there. After WWS2, he volunteered for active duty in the Korean War. Again, he was decorated and wounded, receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was said to be fearless and fierce in battle. He was known to the enemy and believed by some Chinese soldiers to be a demon who could not be terminated. I only knew him years later, retired, disabled, a gentle giant who loved home and family and simple pleasures like a good cup of coffee or a good meal. He loved to visit friends and relatives and was known by everyone in the community. At reunions of the vets of the 164th, grown men would burst into tears upon seeing him, telling his wife and family they would not be alive except for Woody. The safest place to be was right next to Woody. It was an honor to have known him. True badass. Story 25. I don't know if they were badass, but two brothers I went to school with fled Iran in the 80s on foot to get asylum in the USA. They did this around age 13, and it took them months of hiking and sneaking around to get to a safe place to finally get to the U.S. Maybe not badass in the tradition sense, but mad props to them for braving it and pulling it off. Story 26. I thought of all the people I know that would qualify. Veterans, firemen, police officers. But I don't think any are as badass as my cousin. She is a normal woman, head of her own accounting firm. But that woman must have angered a god at some point in her youth, and she has punched back everything that god threw at her. Lost her dad to cancer at 14. Discovered young. She was barren, adopted two kids of a different country and skin color, raised them both to become smart, sensitive, successful people, suffered a massive stroke in her 30s S, survived, was fully paralyzed for years, recovered at 99%, had two heart attacks in her 40 S, survived both despite all this, she is still the most positive, caring, and loveliest person ever, always fought like hell to survive and raise her kids, I want her by my side in a zombie apocalypse. Also, I never complain when I get sick because she never did. Story 27. My grandmother. She fought cancer six different times over 17 years. Through it all, she took care of five grandchildren, attended almost every game and graduation, kept a beautifully tended garden, and kept the whole family together. But to me, the most badass part of it all is in all that time she never once complained or showed fear. As her doctor told her her liver was failing during her sixth fight, she looked at him and said, well, I'll just have to get better then. She is the inspiration for my life and I hope I face the challenges in my life with half the courage she had. We lost her in January this year. I miss her every day, but I'm confident in saying I had the privilege to be raised by one of the strongest and most graceful women in history. Story 28. One of my SO's closest friends used to share a house with an ex-SAS member. I'm going to choose not to list any specific bad peach things they have done in case it outs them. It includes taking on armed robbers while half asleep and unarmed in their boxers. But I'm posting mostly to comment on the fact that despite them being very bad peach, they also suffered from terrible PTSD and struggled to function in normal society. Being bad peach often comes at a price. Story 29. A U.S. Army Special Forces Green Beanie, who did four tours in Vietnam. He had command of an autonomous company of Montagnard, with whom he would infiltrate the north in places in Cambodia, where they did assassinations, blew up infrastructure and supply lines along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He even filed his teeth to sharp points in the fashion of the Montagnard warriors. He stepped on a mine and lost his leg above the knee. He was one of my patients. He wanted to go back to Vietnam, but because his leg was an AK, above knee amputation, they refused him and forced him out of the army. Some of the stories he told were incredible, but he had all the chest salad and commendations to prove them. 
He was really kind of an unassuming guy and looked a little like Roy Clark from Hee Haw and was a really funny guy who laughed a lot. But he was also a stone-cold killer. He liked coming up behind an enemy guard and slitting their throat and disappearing. He told us of one time he terminated every guard around the perimeter of an NVA camp and watched them bad person out when they found the bodies. He said he did the same thing at the same camp the following night, but almost got caught and barely escaped. He had a lot of stories, but he also had a couple of silver stars and a commendation medal, along with statements from his commanders about his actions. I'll never forget that guy. Story 30. Two years ago, a friend of mine named Beto did the most badass thing that I have ever heard of, at least from the people I know. He was leaving a bar with his girlfriend, and as they were walking out, he saw a group of four men jumping a smaller-sized man. Never being one to back down from an unjust situation, he yelled at the four men to leave the guy alone. He had had enough. They turned on him and attacked my friend. He fought off the four guys until he tripped and fell, where at that point, two of the guys pulled out knives and stabbed my friend repeatedly. He tried to fight them off still, but when he knew he could no longer do so, he told them to stop stabbing him. They did not. He was rushed to a nearby hospital, where he continued to fight for his life for two days, until he succumbed to his injuries. I have seen the guys that did this to my friend, and three out of the four are fairly large individuals. I often think to myself, would I have done what was right in that moment? Would I have done what Beto did? More often than not, I can't see myself willingly defending someone I didn't know, knowing that there would be hell to pay. The stranger getting jumped would have been terminated that night, but he was saved. He was saved by someone who throughout his life always fought for the underdog. He always fought against the unjust and did what he believed was right. Oddly enough, we all referred to him as badass when we were blessed with his short presence here on Earth. Rest in peace, Beto Badass. Story 31. My friend from grade school and high school turned into a very impressive soldier. He's in the Air Force and has been decorated for helping some Afghan commandos out of a bad situation. Physically, he's the most intimidating person I can imagine. He looks like a super soldier. Otherwise, he's one of the nicest guys with a great sense of humor. Story 32. I never met my granddad, but he was pretty B.A. He was a fighter pilot in WU2. He was down twice. The first time he made it back to the Allied side, the second time he was captured, and his best friend Wingman was executed in front of him. My uncle would later be named after his friend that was terminated. When the POW camp that he was held at was liberated, they found him cutting up the chocolate bar the Germans would five to the officers. He was dividing it up to give as many prisoners a piece as possible. After he was rescued, he was sent home and the army dropped him off in New York. He went to his uncle's house, who he knew lived there prior to joining. When his uncle answered the door, he had a heart attack because his family thought he had passed away. His uncle thought he was seeing a ghost. Luckily, he survived. Story 33. My grandfather, born in 46 in 66, he dodged the draft by joining the Airborne. In the war, he was a mobile helicopter mechanic meaning he was sent behind enemy line to fix a helicopter whenever it crashed or had issues. He also sighted in guns, explains why he's the best I know. He has a purple heart, but he won't say what from. After the war, he was a ranch hand in Montana. In 1980, he moved to Washington and built a log home by himself from the logs he... He then got into forestry and is one of the best foresters around. Hayes worked in Canada, New Zealand, Chile, and half the states. At 72, he has survived three major heart attacks and cardiac arrests, and yet he still works full-time in the woods. Best story from him was when he stood off to a standing mother grizzly bear in Alaska. Edit, he also looks like a stereotypical older lumberjack. Story 34, probably my ex fiance She knew six languages. Sambo, Russian form of martial arts, was a great cook, bounty hunter, unlicensed private investigator, stripper, could take a taser like no one's business, could, knife fight, helped take down a small human trafficking ring, a dog fighting ring, and rescued a small girl from a kidnapping. There was a couple of other things here and there, but these were the most impressive. Story 35. My cousin Christopher was born with autism, didn't speak a word till he was six years old, and was developmentally delayed all through his education. However, he has always been a kind soul, and most people recognize that in him. With a lot of support and life experience, he learned by brute force the social rules most of us are blessed to learn as children and teens only by experience. He went from not being able to talk to graduating high school at 20, and he now takes care of himself and also photographs weddings for money on the side. He's very talented. Most people who meet him can't even tell his condition because he's so talented with conversation. And if he slips up and says something awkward, he'll respond, I'm very sorry. I have autism. Did I say something that made you uncomfortable? Just an all-around genuine dude who was dealt a bad hand and made the most out of it. Love that guy. Story 36, my second comment, but my grandmother is a flipping bad peach. 
After her husband turned into an abusive alcoholic, and after protecting her family from him for almost 10 years, she left him, took all three of their kids, went to college while supporting them, got a degree and became a CPA, broke into what was then an all-male industry, became the first female partner of an accounting firm in Mobile, Alabama. Now she is getting old, but she refuses to quit. She won't retire and she won't stop being involved with the city because it means too much to her. Also, B -O -D -E. Story 37. My mom. She's loving and nurturing, but also fiercely independent. Before she got pregnant with me, her and my dad were living in a bad city. They heard loud noises outside and my mom caught some huge dude trying to steal her car battery. She was holding a bat and chased the guy all the way around the block and almost beat his peach. Story 39. For something a bit less murdery. I met a lady named Dorothy from Seattle on a dive boat in Mexico. She was in her 70s and had done over 1,000 scuba dives. She traveled the world and dove and did as she pleased, including exchanging a few dirty jokes in Spanish with the dive masters. I want to be like Dorothy when I grow up. Story 40. My granddad, 1920 to 2006, joined WUW to aged 19. His primary role was the demolition of bridges across France to slow the advance of the Germans. Buried alive among the rubble of such explosions on three occasions when duty called for the bridge to be blown at short notice and terminated a German soldier in close quarters combat whilst on duty in France. Survived a direct bomb strike by German Air Force on munitions fact. Swam from the beaches of Dunkirk. Survived three heart attacks. Survived a stroke. Survived the death of my nan by a full decade despite the clear and obvious heartbreak. Finally succumbed to diabetes at the age of 86 in Farnborough Hospital. He was upright and able-bodied until his final days and only once spoke of terminating the German soldier, and that was in the final week of his life. Such was the profound effect it had on him as a young man. I am glad I spent as much time with him in his final years as I did. He was an unassuming man but had instilled in him the quiet resolve of someone who had seen and done things most of us will never have to. And he did it so we wouldn't have to. Support your armed forces. Story 41. Don't want to sound cliche, but a 90-year-old Holocaust survivor who came face to face with Dr. Mengele. I asked her how she did not lose hope and faith, and she said something like, giving up hope was just not an option. Pretty badass if you ask me. Story 42. My husband, he can open cans with knives, make knives, do welding things and building things, just lots of outdoorsy type knowledge, and it's incredibly cool. Camping is like dual survival with him. Also spent time in prison, so his ramen skills are on point. Story 43. I'm a painter, and one of my clients is a self-made gazillionaire in commercial real estate. Awesome dude. Super humble a real-life undercover boss. Honest to God, most people think he's either homeless or the janitor, and he gets quite a kick out of being very secretive. He's in his late 70s and works harder than anyone I know. Anyhow, one of his tenants, a loud mouth car dealer who flaunts every dollar he has, tried in vain to look cool in front of one of his friends he was standing with. He told the landlord, You know what, Bob? I'm kind of tired of paying the rent to you every month. How about I just buy this building from you? Without breaking stride, Bob looks him square in the eyes and says, Tough luck. Sonny, I don't sell buildings. I buy them. Story 44. A guy in my husband's unit called an airstrike on his own location once because he was near a high-profile enemy while deployed and made sure his squad got out first. He didn't think he was going to be able to escape and couldn't let the enemy go. He lived. Enemy didn't. Got several medals for that one. Story 45. I met a South African guy about 12 years back. Long story, but he was in my little town for a conference on truck brakes along with my neighbor. He calls me in the evening to go to the hotel they're in to take advantage of the free bar. This guy is big, near six and a half feet, with a huge, vivid scar on his neck, from collarbone to the opposite ear. Looks terrifying, but after a couple of beers, my neighbor asks where his scar came from. I was carjacked many years ago. A man reached through the window and my throat to steal my car. I asked what happened then. I punched him until he was dead. Calm as fudge, but slightly sad when he told the story. Nice geezer, though. Story 46. My grandfather. He was a blacksmith before joining the Luftwaffe as a paratrooper or Fallschirmjager. He didn't really have a choice as the oldest of five kids. Turns out he was a good soldier and was made the bodyguard of one of his commanding officers. Fought in Crete and apparently jumped out of the plane from a height of 20 feet at almost stall speed without his chute. He was on the Grand Sasso raid where they crashed, landed a glider onto the side of a mountain, and rescued Mussolini from the Allies. He was also one of the last men out of Monte Cassino. He was in the knee and got a ricocheted bullet in the cheek. An allied medic saved his life. He spent two years in a POW camp and had to give up blacksmithing because his face couldn't take the heat anymore. There wasn't any work for him in Germany, so he came to Canada alone. Saved his money working as a tow truck driver and brought over his wife and two kids. They bought a farm even though they were city slickers and my grandmother would foster newborns until they were old enough for adoption. 
They kept one of the babies because they couldn't stand the heartache of giving them up anymore. He was a crack and a good mechanic, had a great sense of humor about everything. He grew a crazy mustache to hide a big scar on his lip and used to have a gag light bulb that would light up when he put it in his mouth. He had a plate in there, the bulb light when it touched metal. He introduced me to Monty Python and loved the search for the Holy Grail. Even when he was dying of cancer, he would still quite the film and laugh, I'm not dead yet, he was a real badass. I asked him if he was a hero in the war and he told me, the real heroes never got to come home. Even at almost 80, with a bad knee, he still walked almost everywhere. Opa was a badass. Story 47. My self-defense professor. He's 60 70 years old and is a true master at martial arts. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame the same day as Chuck Norris. He trains military and police and has also helped in movies. He is the most zen man but can have you on the ground in seconds. Story 48. Never met him, but I once saw a guy come out of his car and confront a group of about six, seven guys. The group then surrounded him and one of them went for a chokehold from the back while the rest all tried to charge at him. This one guy bent over and started carrying the guy trying to choke him and charged back at the group and the entire group all fell like bowling balls. They were all on the floor while this guy was just punching a pile of guys on the floor. Unfortunately, the cops came and arrested all of them. Hope he got away with that. Story 49. My aunt is a tough mama jama and has been that way since she was a kid and no one dared to mess with her. One day when she was a teenager, she was walking down the street when a white van pulled up behind her and four, five guys jumped out and tried to take her. She beat them all up, then went home. Story 50. My dad. When he was 12, my grandpa used to go up north fishing for a week at a time and leave him in charge of the family farm. No instructions, just get it all done, the milking, the calving, the deliveries, everything. When he was 22, he was a sergeant in the army, guarding nuclear warheads in the DMZ. He was in charge of sending his men on missions. He knew some of them wouldn't come back. When he was 30, he was managing a service station in a ghetto, in the worst neighborhood in one of the worst cities in the U.S. My dad is white and 5'7", yet he never had any trouble from customers or employees that he couldn't handle. When he was 35, he decided that he didn't want to be a mechanic for the rest of his life and went back to college. He was working and going to college full-time. In the 1980s, online classes weren't an option, so he was commuting to school an hour and a half one way three days a week. He started teaching while he was in grad school. When he was 40, he had his master's degree. When he was 45, he was a full-time professor of math and economics at a small college. Along the way, he survived cancer, put his beloved sick dog out of its misery himself, and taught basic math at an open admission school in one of the poorest, most violent cities in America. Some of his students could not divide by zero. My dad did not choose to manage a farm or guard nuclear warheads, and he didn't even really choose to manage a gas station. He struggled to find a job after the army, and took the first one he could. I say he is a badass because the biggest choice he did make, the choice to quit his job, start college again, and pull a 180-degree career shift was not one many people make, and it took a lot of courage. My dad is now 70 and retired and gets up at 5.30 every morning and chops wood. For fun. Story 51. When I was 16, went to Florida with my family and met another 16-year-old who called himself, claimed to have taken a bus from NY alone since his parents wouldn't give him a vacation. Anyways, he eats a meal with me and my friend and gets up to go to the bathroom before the check comes. That is the last I saw of? Story 52. This one is chalked up to the most badass-looking dude I've ever seen. During Army Medic Training School, AIT for the military people, we had international soldiers come and experience the course with us to bring back how we were training our medics to their home country. Joining us was a 6'4 German Skut Maj, a special forces medic who had been in the German Special Service for years, sporting a full-length beard and always wore sunglasses, like inside, outside, training events. Didn't matter he had his shades on. One day, I managed to catch a glimpse of him without his shades on. He was talking to one of the platoon sergeants and took them off momentarily to reveal a clearly visible scar of a gunshot wound to the face. And not only that, he was missing his eye. But instead of a fake eye with the pupil and whatnot, it was just a straight prothesis. Badass men right there. Story 53. I met a guy down in Florabama, as glorious as it sounds, who was missing an arm, and his story was he was getting ready for a triathlon, and a bull shark bit his stomach, showed me the scar, and then took his arm. He told me it happened in the bay we were swimming in at that moment. Story 54. In all honesty, my mom, she had to deal with so much cow while she and my dad were raising my brother, and I and she did a pretty, oh no, flipping good job. She's had to deal with the depression that came after she accidentally terminated someone in a car accident my older sister and her candy problem, my uncle, her younger brother, 
who's lived with us for the majority of my life and could be a real piece of cow, trying to make ends meet after the recession hit and she lost her store, nearly losing our house a couple times. My brother's depression and the absolute cow storm that was me in elementary school when my ADHD meds were flipping with my emotions to the point that I threatened suicide. She had to deal with all that raising me, and I turned out pretty well. I think she qualifies. Story 55. My uncle, flunked out of Bud's training due to stress fractures, went back in after he healed up, got his kneecaps out on mission, didn't know it had happened until someone told him he was bleeding. He lives in Cali now, fixes Porsches and other classic sports cars for fun, does 50-mile mountain biking for fun, and just recently got into MMA. He's also about 5'3". Story 56. His name, and I am not joking, was Cliff Hunter. He worked at a wilderness camp for troubled youth and could start friction fires with both a bow drill and a hand drill. He collected plants to use for the hand drill and dried them out. He could also make deadfall traps. He was super fit and was an extremely nice guy. Story 57. This guy I know took a Claymore mine to the chest in Vietnam. As they were operating on him, the field hospital was bombed, so they threw sandbags on him and hid until the bombing stopped. Once it was over, they just continued removing the shrapnel. He was given last rites twice, made it home and drove a Budweiser truck for 30 years in the Bronx. Story 58. My grandmother was the daughter of immigrants who raised 13 kids, mostly by herself, after her husband passed away of cancer. The same year he passed away, her mom also passed away, and four of the kids got polio. She always had home-cooked food on the table and clothes on everyone's backs. She did this in the 60s when women working was pretty uncommon. She was tough as nails because she had no choice. Story 59. A farmer in my hometown? Being a World War II veteran already gives the guy's badass rating a significant boost. But specifically, I remember he fell about 10 feet off a windmill that he was fixing and broke several ribs when he was in his late 70s. He was hospitalized, and there was serious talk that this was probably it. He stood a good chance of getting pneumonia or another of the many complications that the elderly tend to get when hospitalized and dying from it. That never happened, and he got out of the hospital as soon as he could. His sons practically had to tie him down to keep him from going out and working until he had fully recovered. But as soon as the doctors said he was fully healed, he was back at it. He passed away a couple years back at around 92 or so years old and was out farming every day until the last couple months of his life. Story 60. A guy I met 20 years ago who ran an orphanage in East Ukraine. He had something inexpressible about him. The closest thing I think I've seen to a real-life Jesus Christ. He was a humble, fierce, gentle bear of a man. Bearded and stern, but full of parental love. He was quiet. You could see his grief and burden for every messed up child he and his team tried to rescue from candy and the sewers where they often hid. He had in his eyes such a look of long-suffering, having seen too many kids pass away in horrible ways. He warned them starkly of the dangers, perhaps the only person to show them any care. He gave them a safe place where they could always run to, expended every ounce of energy to give them a home. He was a real present father to hundreds. I remember them crowding round him outside as he told stories and played football with them. The world had abandoned and forgotten them, and he thanklessly took on himself the pain of being their one and only real parent. He called it more worthy than anything else the world had to offer. Though I only spent time with him briefly, he'll always be a role model to me. Story 61. My Grandpa. In the early 1930s, British India, he was the youngest sibling among five, came from a rich family, lost his dad when he was about three. Elder siblings squandered away all the wealth, and by the time he was in his teens, there was none left. He left his house at the age of 14, lived in another city, did all sorts of odd jobs to sustain his education, topped in his college, got a job at the Department of Inspectorate of Factories, climbed the ladder to become the chief inspector of factories at the time of his retirement. He became a legend at his workplace for his straightforward, courageous attitude. Back then, Indian industries were pretty corrupt. He took it upon himself to spy, investigate various factories, led surprise inspections, saved countless workers from multiple factories who were forced to work in inhuman conditions, with no protection against chemicals or machines used, given below minimum wages and made to work illegally during night hours under dim lights to avoid being caught by authorities. Got chased by politicians who were bribed by these factory owners, stood up to them, and stood up for the people who were oppressed. And while doing all this, also single-handedly raised a family of four after having tragically lost the love of his life, his wife at a young age. One of his daughters became my mother, and he became my grandfather, raised me while both my parents were working. He was the smartest man I'd come across, taught me everything I know in science, and his special love for math rubbed off on me too. Eventually, I would top my mathematics examination on a national level, all thanks to him.
Up until his passing away last year, he could work out complex math problems intellectually, describe physics theories like he learned it yesterday, and didn't lose his sanity being close to his 90s. Can one man be so many things? I have always admired and respected him to the core, and all credit goes to him for what I am today. I can never match up to his legacy, but I'm glad his blood runs in me. Our bond is way too strong to be broken and goes across dimensions. Life has been extremely hard this last one year without him. He passed away while in sedation with me standing next to him. Although I knew it was too late, I whispered in his ears that he was the best thing ever that happened to me. Life will not be the same, but we will be together no matter what.